So I've been going over the Bilderberg notes, including the meeting list for the past several days now. I cover it every year and I have since 2006, so that's 12 years now. And I've never seen a Bilderberg meeting quite like this one. This is probably going to prove to be unprecedented. Certainly, I haven't seen a meeting like it anytime recently in the past several decades. A huge convergence of very high officials and clearly an agenda which <laughs> is either a push for war or the build up to something very big on the geopolitical stage. And the thing is, there's just not that many independent reporters who are left that are going to actually tell you that. And what I'm seeing this year is actually a total downplaying of Bilderberg. And when they are reporting on it, they're focusing on the populism angle because there's three tracks that are going on at this Bilderberg. And one track has to do with quantum computing, artificial intelligence and tech. The other track has to do with populism, the economy and a world where work is going to be supplanted by technology. Those two things are there. But the third thing has to do specifically with Russia as a topic, Saudi Arabia and Iran as a topic together, and then U.S. world leadership. Okay? But that's not the only thing that's going on. In something that, and I went back and looked, you guys, I went back and looked every year back down through the late 90s, and I have not seen this happened before. So it may have happened before, but it hasn't happened in at least, at least the last 20 years. This year's Bilderberg meeting, which is being held June 7th through 10th in Turin, Italy, also happens to fall on both days of the G7. That's the group of seven meeting that brings together the leaders of Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, the UK, and the United States, with both the president of the European Commission and the president of the European Council, both of the European Union, all together in the same room. Both days of that, but also it's going to fall on both days of a NATO defense ministers meeting. So in other words, what I'm saying is for one day, the meetings of Bilderberg, the NATO defense ministers, and the G7 will all be on the same exact day. Something that has not happened in at least two decades. And for the record, I stopped looking after two decades, so it could be even longer. But not only that, okay, but this particular NATO defense ministers meeting, which will be June 7th and 8th, the first two days of Bilderberg, being held in Brussels, by the way, an hour and a half flight away from where the Bilderberg group is meeting, is also supposed to be focused on Russia. In addition to a brand new announcement that NATO is set to unveil a new plan to reinforce their presence in Europe in the event of any crisis, with the deployment of 30 troop battalions, 30 squadrons of aircraft, and 30 warships within 30 days after this meeting. And the NATO meeting is going to be chaired by NATO Secretary General Jen Stoltenberg, or is that Yen Stoltenberg? I'm probably saying it wrong who is also on the Bilderberg attendees list. So in other words, it's basically as if the NATO defense ministers, all of them, will also be attending Bilderberg because the guy chairing their meeting is going to go from there to Bilderberg. And really the same could be said for the G7 meeting because how hard is it to make a conference call? And what I'm telling you is that is the first time that that has happened in at least 20 years. But this is unprecedented that this is happening. Not to mention, as Aaron looked into it, how many high-level governments are being represented at this year's Bilderberg? There's usually a lot of government people. That's absolutely true. But this is pervasive. This is most of Europe. And straight away, there has never been a Bilderberg meeting on record with a high-level official or anyone from the Vatican, who are, of course, their own independent government, politically, economically, everything, its own entity. And they have the Secretary of State for the Vatican, Pietro Piolin, in attendance. To deliver or receive a message, they are in high communication. And the Vatican is involved, of course, in all kinds of world affairs, but never before directly involved with anything to do with Bilderberg itself. Not true this year. So that's one of the heads of state. you got Turkey's Deputy Prime Minister, Mehmet Simsek, who's next door to everything happening in the Middle East and working closely with the Western partners. And then you've got most of the rest of Western Europe represented with the foremost spy chief of France, as well as its Minister of Armed Forces. He's in attendance. You've got the current Prime Ministers of Estonia, the little state next to Russia. 
Estonia. F is for friends who do stuff together. U is for you and me. N is for anywhere and anytime at all. Serbia, the former Yugoslavian state in the Balkans. You've got the Prime Minister of Belgium and the Netherlands in attendance. They've both been there multiple times in recent years. Additionally, you've got a former Prime Minister of France. You've got the Deputy Prime Minister to Spain. You've got the General Secretary of the Office of the President of Austria. So you've got the top aide to the President of Austria. You've got Germany's Federal Minister of Defense. And then you also have a diplomat named Wolfgang Eichinger, who's been leading the Munich Security Conferences since 2008 that deals especially with terrorism and uh, security concerns throughout Europe, and they bring people together from each of the countries. On top of that, you've got Great Britain, who of course always have many powerful officials. Their ex-spy chief, former MI6 chief John Sowers is there, and former Secretary of State Amber Rudd is also in attendance. Then you have Poland's former foreign affairs and defense minister, Radislaw Sikorski, who is not only now on the Bilderberg Conference, but he's married to another Bilderberg attendee, the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, Anne Applebaum, who happens to have written about Russian gulags and writes quite a bit of negative press about Russia. And this guy, being from Poland, uh, encircling Russia and Far East Europe, uh, very much an agitator of all things anti-Russia. His wife, Ann Applebaum, has not only been a prolific writer in many of the prominent papers, but she's been leading think tanks and special forums dealing with regime change and revolution, the use of 21st century propaganda, and the use of disinformation. That is what they specialize in. So very, very cute couple, very interesting people there. And of course, the King of the Netherlands is also there, King Willem Alexander. He's the grandson of Prince Bernhard, who was the founding chairman of the group and the son of Queen Beatrix, who took his place, and she attended for many years. Well, not only that, so you basically have a former MI6 chief there. The former head of France's version of the CIA is going to be there. We also have former CIA directors for the U.S. going to be there. We have Henry Kissinger there. I mean... I guess what we're saying is, if you wanted to start a war, I'm not really sure who else you would invite to it, but all of the people that are going to Bilderberg, the G7, and this NATO defense minister's meeting that's, again, unprecedented that it's the, all three of these meetings are sharing a, a common day. They might as well be sharing a common room. This is all these people being together in the same room on the same day anywhere has not happened and if you look around at the things that are actually going on today, and then you look at the fact that they not only put Russia on the list of topics, but Saudi Arabia and Iran together as one topic, it's pretty disheartening, okay? The anti-Iran rhetoric has been ratcheting up ever since pro-Israel Bush-era war hawk John Bolton took over as Trump's national security advisor. Now I'm going to go through some of these things because you guys need to see this for the bigger picture, okay? He came in on April 9th. That same day, Israel, in continuing its shadow war against Iran in Syria, did an, a pre-dawn airstrike that killed four Iranian military advisors. And they've conducted more airstrikes on major Iranian targets in Syria. On April 30th, there was one where they killed 26 people, and it was reported at least 18 of them were Iranians. So Israel is involved in what they're calling a shadow war against Iran in Syria right now. And they've been doing all these strikes, but they never confirm or deny the strikes. They don't confirm that it was them that did it, right? But all of a sudden, back on March 21st, right before John Bolton came in, Israel came out in a rare admission that they claim they struck a Syrian nuclear facility back in 2007. So 11 years after the fact, now all of a sudden, right before Bolton comes in, Israel is admitting that they struck a Syrian nuclear facility and they're coming out to admit it now, 11 years later, because they say it's a warning to Iran today. And as for John Bolton, you might also remember him from the fact that in 2015, he wrote an op-ed for the New York Times titled, To Stop Iran's Bomb, Bomb Iran. 
okay? And in that op-ed, he was advocating for a unilateral preemptive strike on Iran, just out of the box. Don't even declare war. He said the United States could do a thorough job of destruction, but Israel alone can do what's necessary. Such action should be combined with vigorous American support for Iran's opposition aimed at regime change in Tehran. But it's not over because speaking of regime change, then on May 8th, just a few weeks ago, Trump dumped the Iran deal, which was not backed in the international community by any other countries but, but Saudi Arabia and Israel. But they've come out and said the Iran deal isn't even the problem. The problem that they have is the Iranian regime, which is timely because two days after Trump dumped the Iran deal on May 10th, the Washington Free Beacon was reporting that national security officials in the White House were, were circulating a three-page white paper authored by a John Bolton-connected national security think tank called Security Studies Group that was openly discussing the new plan for regime change in Iran, something that Bolton also trumpeted in that op-ed back from 2015. You had several sources in the White House being quoted by the Beacon, unnamed sources, whatever, they always like to do that. But one of them reportedly said that Team Bolton has spent years creating plans B, C, and D for dealing with the Iranian regime, and that President Trump hired him knowing that. And that the administration will now start aggressively moving to deal with the root cause of chaos and violence in the region, which they have stated is the Iranian regime, not the Iran deal, in a clear-eyed way. And another source said that, quote, nothing's off the table right now if Israel is attacked. If Iran were to restart its nuclear weapons program, do you believe the president can order a unilateral attack to stop that program? And if so, under what authority? Senator, I'd, I'd prefer not to talk about a hypothetical case like that. General Mad Dog Mattis, who was on no one's radar, he was just some general in our armed forces, high level albeit, happened to attend Bilderberg in 2015 when he was out of office, just ahead of being selected as Trump's Secretary of Defense. So if we are facing a war, General Mad Dog Mattis is in charge, and he is a Bilderberg veteran. Does the United States have a policy of regime change for Iran, and if so, what actions does the president intend to take to implement that policy? Uh, Senator, uh, as you know, our... our uh our problem with Iran is not with the Iranian people. It is with uh, the regime that holds them uh, captive, basically, to the activities they've conducted. But I would let uh, Mr. Bolton and uh, Mr. Giolani speak for themselves, sir. I'd, I'd, I'd prefer not to comment on that. The right policy for Iran, for every good, decent government in the world, is regime change. Regime change. You? Regime change. Regime change. Absolutely. Let him hear it. You saw John Bolton. You remember John Bolton. He's going to be President Trump's national security advisor. You think he changed his mind? No, in fact, if anything, John Bolton has become more determined that, that, that there needs to be regime change in Iran. This policy review to understand what we want the outcome to be and what in the United States many of us are working toward. I have said for over 10 years since coming to these events that the declared policy of the United States of America should be the overthrow of the Mullah's regime in Tehran. The behavior and the objectives of the regime are not going to change, and therefore the only solution is to change the regime itself. And that's why before 2019, we here will celebrate in Tehran. Thank you very much. So you have that going on, and then four days later, after these white papers were circulated, six days after the Iran deal was off, Trump officially moved the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem and recognized it as Israel's capital. So that was the 14th, which caused all that outbreak of violence in Gaza, over 50 people dead. So 
you have a whole bunch of people here besides just the people that Aaron mentioned. If we are going to some kind of major war and it does involve Iran, you have all kinds of people from the U.S. coming over who would weigh in on that. Besides all the banksters that are, are attending who all always attend, but this year you also have Stanley Fisher, former vice chairman of the Federal Reserve and a former vice governor of the Bank of Israel. First of all, you have Henry Kissinger, who used to be Secretary of State and National Security Advisor at the same time. That is for friends who do stuff together. You've also got David Petraeus, the former CIA director and the former head of U.S. CENTCOM, who had to step down in a scandal. That is for friends. But who was nonetheless deeply involved in the Iraq War and all the things that have happened since. Today, he's working for the private leverage buyout firm KKR and their leadership goes every year. They're part of the core group of Bilderberg. The wife of the director, Marie Jose Kravitz, she's on the steering committee of Bilderberg and runs the American Friends of Bilderberg organization. Her husband, Henry Kravitz, also in attendance. And David Petraeus, now a regular attendee as part of their firm and their larger network. Then you've got the young guy, James H. Baker, not the former U.S. Secretary of State under Bush. If we don't get it done the way the administration's working on it now, which I totally agree with, then we ought to take him out. <laughs> but the young James H. Baker, who's director of the Office of Net Assessment from the Office of the Secretary of Defense. So he's within the Pentagon. He advises the Joint Chiefs of Staff on the ongoing assessments for any given country, any potential conflict on any day of the week. And here he is giving that advice to Bilderberg as well. You've got Nadia Shadlow, who was in the Trump administration but has already stepped down. She was at Bilderberg in previous years as well. She worked closely with McMaster, who was Trump's national security advisor, who did attend Bilderberg in 2017. And she is here again as the author of Trump's national security policy. She wrote it, and she also wrote the book War and the Art of Governance, which covered 13 major American wars and the less lessons learned therein going all the way back to the Mexican-American War in the mid-1800s. You also have a little-known guy named Matthew Turpin, who's also part of the National Security Council. He's still in the Trump administration, and he's the National Security Council's expert on China. He's the director for China and can almost certainly speak to China's likely reaction to any major geopolitical events, as well as up-to-date information on what they're involved in throughout the world. Speaking of China, and I didn't know this earlier when I first started this video, but apparently it isn't just Bilderberg and the G7 and the NATO defense ministers all meeting on the same days, but also Russia and China are jointly holding their annual two-day security block summit on the same days as well. Well, the last two days of the Bilderberg meeting this year. So at that meeting, you're going to have... The leadership of China, you're going to have Vladimir Putin and Iranian President Hassan Rouhani. So they're going to be there with India and Pakistan and all those people having a meeting at the same time. I don't know if this has ever happened. I guess the only question I have left is, are there any world leaders on either side of this geopolitical conflict that aren't at a meeting this weekend? Because apparently all of them are. Moreover, you have Jared Cohen, a former member of the State Department Planning Committee, who is working in the private sector at Google and has been for several years. He founded Google Ideas that Eric Schmidt called a think-do tank. And now he has a firm called Jigsaw that's part of Google's parent company, Alphabet, which focuses on protecting data that pertains to <laughs> basically what you can only call regime changes and countries where they have identified or claim to have identified humanitarian crises. And he co-authored a book with Eric Schmidt talking about the new digital age reshaping the future of people, nations, and business. And in it, Jared Cohen details how his dual role as a member of the State Department and as a member of high technology, how he was using State Department leverage to fuel the failed but nonetheless inventive 2009 color revolution in Iran, where he fought to keep Twitter on board and tried to use social media to uh, fuel an internal opposition within Iran. Ran. It didn't work that time, but they have hardly given up. And here he is, and it's just louder than words. 
And the word unprecedented just keeps coming up because two days after Bilderberg ends, there's supposed to be an unprecedented meeting between President Trump and Kim Jong-un in Singapore. They're calling it an unprecedented summit. So whatever, whatever this is, there's a lot, a lot of stuff going on around it. And it's kind of like one of those things that when you look at this, if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck and it walks like a duck, it's probably a freaking duck. I don't understand why there's people coming out right now saying, oh, Bilderberg's just a failed economic group and they never, they don't, they don't even matter anymore. You shouldn't even pay attention to that. People that you, you used to think they were probably on the side of truth. They're obviously on the side of something, but it surely isn't telling you the truth. And this isn't not to scaremonger, but look at this. I mean, you can't not see it once you see it. There are too many high-level people. How many countries are being represented this year? 20? 20 European countries, plus Turkey, plus the U.S., plus Canada, plus NATO, plus the European Commission, and due to the presence of UNESCO, also the United Nations itself. And not to mention the Vatican, who's never attended Thank you. before. and the Vatican. They've never attended before, at least not not that we could ever find. It's being reported this is the first time they've ever attended. What does that say <clears throat> to you? If not that something huge is about to happen and they know it, this is a ramping up unlike I've ever seen around Bilderberg because I usually help in the background and I, I do a little research for Aaron. He does this report every year, but he started showing this to me and he said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Whoa, there's a way too many high level governments being represented this year. This is not normally like this. Well, the other thing that's new about Bilderberg is, I mean, of course, since NATO's inception, it's been basically in opposition to Russia in a de facto way. And Bilderberg essentially is the shadow side of NATO. But representation at Bilderberg from Eastern Europe is relatively new, if not quite new. And this year, you not only have a very curious figure from Poland, but you have the prime minister of Estonia and you've got a railroad official from Latvia now, you, you have to appreciate the geography. Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania are the little tiny countries directly next to Russia, all the way up there, just up the row from Ukraine and Belarus. And you've also got the Prime Minister of Serbia in attendance, Yugoslavia having been equally torn in the fight over communism and everything, and still within Russia's sphere of influence. You've got these people from the eastern side of Europe beginning to attend Bilderberg in a big way, and here they are all at once, very high officials. What is really going on here? Now, I know that Estonia has been in the news because they tried to start a cryptocurrency, and the European Central Bank swatted them down and said, nope. Don't do it. You're not going to do it. You're, you're a happy part of the EU. But with Russia so much in the news and so much on the focus of this group and of other groups, you have to ask what is the real reason that they're courting these little known leaders from the furthest parts of Eastern Europe that you can? And I would just add that obviously Putin sees this list and sees this convergence and knows what's up. He did his annual question and answer session, which is an annual televised call-in show where he fields questions from the public, and he spoke directly to World War III. Remember Einstein, he said, I don't know what will be the methods of World War III, but the Fourth World War will be waged uh, with sticks and stones. So the realization that the Third World War could mean the end of civilization, this realization, this idea should uh, deter us from dang dangerous steps. Uh. So he obviously wanted to put that message out there on the same day as the start of this year's Bilderberg, which is obviously focused on Russia and Iran. And just by the way, what has the Prime Minister of the Netherlands been up to recently? Well, he just formally implicated Russia for their role in downing MH17 and what they claim was a commercial and civilian flight shot down by Baibuk missiles that they claim only Russia could have done. Please explain to me what's going on here. This is the video of the supposed crash site taken on the ground right after it happened. It's been shown all over the place. It's shown here on CNN, they're showing it. I mean, they're showing this looped. Now explain to me what this is. Oh, it's a guy with a whole bunch of passports. What is he doing with them? Oh, he's scattering them all over the ground. Why? Why is he scattering a bunch of passports from the Netherlands all over the ground? 
I mean, you've got the the top liaison for the Pope meeting in secret with some of the most powerful people in the world. That's always been the draw and the appeal of the conspiratorial story of Bilderberg. But it's also real and deadly serious. It doesn't mean there's going to be a war tomorrow, this weekend, or this year. But they are looking at that stuff very closely. And there's every reason to think a major, major provocation is on the near horizon. And that's the thing. I think people look at Bilderberg and they think, oh, what's on the agenda this year? And they always make it sound like it's just every year they just came up with some stuff. But if you actually research Bilderberg and you go back and look at this fully, what you will find is there is a plan behind these meetings, as there has been. And these meetings, actually, everyone always reports Bilderberg started in 1954 and it was named after the hotel, blah, blah, blah. But I have actually found older articles that talk about the fact that Bilderberg actually started meeting right after World War II was over informally. It didn't become formal until 54. These people had a plan, and that plan goes back a long way. They're not just getting together to share cigars and cognac and back pat each other about what's going on Bob like it's not like that okay it's clear that there is a plan here and if you look at Bilderberg meetings and then things that have happened after the meetings these are influential meetings that actually do inform policy and affect the things that happen after them maybe not immediately maybe not within the next month or even the next year but it happens and it has happened and so to have this many high-level people at a Bilderberg meeting which is unprecedented, together with all of the G7 meeting on the same day, together with all of these guys from the NATO defense minister who are saying that now in the event of any crisis, so they're being vague, but they're going to deploy 30 troop battalions, 30 squadrons of aircraft, and 30 warships. A big move is being made right now. And the weirdest thing about it all is one of the other topics on their list this year is the post-truth world. And everyone says, oh, that's just going to be about the fake news. But is it really? I'd say that's your superficial way to look at it. That's your superficial meaning of it. Sure, fake news. But also, who owns the truth right now? Who, who is eliminating the truth? Who, who are the people that used to tell the truth and have obviously decided not to for whatever reason anymore? There's just not a lot of people left that don't have an agenda or haven't sold out to one side or the other. You can't just see it and go, eh, someone else will report on that. Because I looked around and there's just, there's not that many independent reporters left talking about any kind of truth. 